Welcome to Camera Ready and Able, the podcast that explores the intersection of media change and personal growth. I'm your host, Barbara Barna Abel, and my calling is to help you tap into your superpowers to thrive on camera and in life and to make an impact on the world. This episode is brought to you by the word failure. According to experts on the interwebs, failure is defined as a lack of success or the inability to meet an expectation. Failure is a loaded word, in my opinion, and open to interpretation and certainly a matter of perception. I'm thrilled that here to discuss with me is Ben Courier, the self-proclaimed world's number one failure, who is the host of the ironically successful Failure Guy podcast, which Chartable ranks in the 99.8 percentile for global reach, which is certainly a marker of success, most definitely not a failure. Ben has spent the last 15 years in corporate America financially forecasting billions of dollars across multiple industries and is an Excel guru. In fact, Ben created one of the top online Excel courses per Investopedia. And yet, despite his successes, Ben has been fired from every job he's had since graduating from college, which inspired him to investigate how to get better at dealing with failure rather than avoiding facing the reality of the problems. I want to find out more about what that means. His mantra is turn setbacks into success. Welcome, Ben. I'm so stoked that you're here. I'm so excited to be here and I'm so excited because I got to have you on my podcast. That was a, a blessing and, and an enjoyment and I am very happy to repay that in whatever way I can. Oh, thank you. Because I was thrilled to be on your podcast and I think I'm going to re-air it on the camera ready and able podosphere. And, um, and just to say, I'm like so thrilled because I think it's like LinkedIn and podcasting and all these things that brought us together, which is one of the joys of having a podcast is, is really connecting and having conversations and meeting extraordinary people that I wouldn't get to know otherwise, uh, which includes you. you know. So we have had the opportunity to discuss failure in depth in the past. So one of my questions is, you've been at podcasting for a while and are doing really, really well at it. Has your definition of failure evolved in the process? So uh, weirdly, I had no expectations around any success <laughs> with the podcast itself. So I started out with, um, I mean, we can go to the inception story of how I became the failure guy, but really once I had started embracing failure and I wanted to write a book on it, which was going to be called The Power of Effing Up <laughs> or Why I'm Happy I Was Fired from Every Job I've Ever Had or something to that effect, um, I realized I only know my brand of failure. So I thought I'd start a podcast and then interview uh, successful people or people who have dealt with a lot of failure in their life and figure out how they deal with it and also become a better expert on the subject of failure uh, via the podcast. So I didn't expect anyone to ever let, necessarily care. My original goal when I started was so that if you ask Alexa who the world's number one failure is, it would be my name. Meaning my goal was had nothing to do with downloads. It had nothing to do with anything but just being more comfortable with failure, putting myself out there and interviewing people on their own failures. If I'm hearing you correctly, this is such a matter of perception, by the way, which I love that you just said, because we're going to delve into what you meant by your brand of failure. But I'm also hearing in there something I'm kind of obsessing with right now was that you were looking for artificial intelligence to validate your failure. I love that. I just, I, that is such a like weirdly meta contemporary thing. I didn't care about downloads. I just wanted Alexa to see me. It was more like I knew world's number one accountant. A lot of, lot of competition. World's number one failure, almost none. I thought this license plate would be taken when I asked for it, and it was not. So, like, my my uh, view of failure is substantially different than the average person's. I found out over many times of people saying they hate the word, they don't believe in the word, all sorts of different reactions, which I, I totally understand. But, like, really my true definition of failure is to have um, tried something, have it not succeed, and then not learn anything from it that is failure because you've already paid the cost of, of learning the, what went wrong, but to purge it from your memory or to purge it from your existence or to pretend like it never happened. Um, that's really the ultimate failure. And I think it took me five times getting fired to even realize I was fired from all the jobs because I'd be telling a different story in each interview as to what happened and what I did and didn't do. So I was telling myself all these lies and then I was like, Oh wow, this is five for five right now. I'm at six. So since the podcast started, I got fired from a job as well. 
But the point is, uh, I was like, well, there's something wrong. I've been reading all these self-help books and I've been implementing none of the things that are positive or like able to pr produce results, but they all say to be comfortable with failure. So I'm like, I'll put on my license plate. I have to look at it every morning. There's no way I'm not going to get comfortable with it. So it was like kind of like exposure therapy. And also every time someone drives by me, I was in a Prius anyway, so they're judging me to begin with, but then add the failure thing to it. I would be like, Oh man, I wonder what this person's thinking. I wonder what that person's thinking. After like a year and a half, I was just drumming on my steering wheel and I didn't care what anybody thought. And so it was a really quick way for me to hopefully get rid of some of those feelings of, of what are people thinking of me? So I could show up as more of my true self. Cause a lot of times at work, I would be work Ben. And then at home, I'd be whoever the hell I am at home. And then every time I got fired, they became more like the same person, more like home Ben. And then now that's all I can be. And, you know, that to me is a, is a success, but apparently me isn't meant for corporate America. So uh, I took the hint finally and I'm not trying to go back. Okay, but I was, after I was getting a master's, it's tough not to that. do that, you know? Oh, see, okay. That's about expectations. This is real. Oh, this is so good. I'm loving having this deep dive with you, Ben, because you are clearly a genius and very successful at seeing opportunity and creating opportunity and stepping into it and, and, and seeing things differently than everybody else, which is an incredible gift. And, you know, and then learning, you know, what do I do with that? And I love that you finally tapped into what was going through my head. It was like, okay, being fired from these jobs was not to, in my mind, a failure, right? Because it's often you're being handed an opportunity to see, and there's a lesson and what we see as an obstacle is often, you know, assigned to like redirect. And I, and it's like, so when you're getting asked to leave or for whatever the circumstances are, why you're, you're leaving five, six jobs, it's like, you're not supposed to be there. You're supposed to absolutely be where you are right now doing what you're doing. And, oh, I salute you. I just adore you for that, Ben. So here's a question then. What did you do after you finally started to embrace the advice from all the books, the ancient wisdom of embracing failure? You said you hadn't implemented any of the other steps. Did you finally, were there any other steps after that? that I don't even know if I'm making yeah. any sense, but you, know what I'm <laughs> I love, like, I... you were given all this advice. You're like, bah, I'm not doing any of that. So, uh, but the one thing I can do is, is I'm finally understanding that I've been feeding myself a narrative and that's an actually such self-awareness that you yeah. were falling for your own BS. You were like, I got to go in and tell a story. And then you started to believe the story that you made up and you didn't, you couldn't compartmentalize. Okay. We got that. And then you're like, okay, I need to embrace the, the, the failure part. What happens next? Well, so I think it all started out when I was growing up. I mean, everything starts out there. I don't know how you start out growing up already, but you get the point. Um, so my stepdad, who was verbally and physically abusive to both I'm me sorry. and my mom, but not, that's not the point. The point is he told me he would work like uh, either hot tar roofing jobs or a snow plow. He would do very physically manual labor. And he told me the one piece of advice that he ever gave me that stuck out is that you can pay now and play later, meaning go to school, do the right thing, and then play when you grow up. Or you can play now like he did, like not, not pay attention to school and pay later, which is when you grow up. Now, unfortunately, he only lived one life, and that was the version he lived. He didn't know that you still don't get to play, even if you go to school, and even if you get a master's degree in business, and all that other stuff, you still, I'm like, when do I get to play? Isn't this the play time? And no, it's, it's just get more efficient at your work, and they'll still keep giving you 40 hours of work a week. So if I can take a 20 hour task, and make it take 10 minutes, I get a 19 hour and 50 minute new tasks, no matter what, you know, I didn't get to keep the time I saved. So it's more like I could keep getting better at this thing the whole time. And also I don't want to play corporate politics. So I will never play that game. As what I said, I'll just get better at the software and get, make it take less time, but you, we Ooh, don't, even with industrialization, deep. we didn't mm -hmm. get to save time. We just had to work more or whatever. It, had to work the same amount. A thousand percent. All this stuff, because when I was in college and doing internships, it was the beginning of people talking about paperless offices and the transition to different technology and things were just like FedEx was brand new and, and, and different technologies coming. So what I'm just saying is the fact that there used to be time was budgeted. Like you knew it took this many days for a contract to get sent out and come back. 
And my whole long-winded version of the story is just tell you, we discovered it did not create more leisure time. It created more opportunity for us to work. You're absolutely right. So we just, our capacity increased, but our mental bandwidth and our capacity to um, live life did not expand you know, in relationship to the amount of work yeah. that we can now pile on. This is, so this is super deep and that you're getting this. And then also I want to circle back this expectation that you were raised with, which so many of us have. If we I poor, get this, by the way, growing up, so. That's Sorry fair enough. Oh, no, not at all. And I think that, and I really appreciate that. I was going to say that with, with the investment of time and money into your advanced degree, the idea of getting an, an MBA or any kind of, same thing if you go to law school, was the idea that like, that's a lot of money and that's a lot of time. And that you, in that um, if you don't do something with it, you have failed. And then there's all these other emotional things we attach it, like disappointment, not mm -hmm. only in yourself, but like letting down your family, letting down a lot of other people, how are we going to pay for this? So I appreciate this. So you're carrying something around that is really weighty and you're not in the place where you're supposed to be. You're working at jobs where it's interesting because it's clear you have such an aptitude for so much of this, but you're out of alignment with your values. Yeah. And I know after they fire me, sometimes they'd have me teach the next person how my model worked. And they're like, this is amazing. Why'd they fire you? And I'm like, because I can't be... Uh, just a, an extrovert who has to talk through numbers and a spreadsheet to people. And also I'm from Boston, so I don't usually hold back. I might say like this, you're not dumb, but this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. If you keep going down that path, even now, when I go visit my parents, um, my, my new stepdad, he'll tell me something like, why don't you just go get a job uh, with all, you know, with all the skill you have? Why don't you just get another job? I'm like, well, A, they don't want me. They've told me over and over again, get out of here, please. We don't want you. And then also I'm telling myself, I don't want to be there. So like, why would I want to go do that only because of money? Well, that's the trap that a lot of people get stuck in and have to do things they don't want for a long time. But I kind of was like, I'm going to try to figure out, I'm going to just not care about money, not, I mean, because I had a lot of ne negative money association issues. So I was like, at one point I was like, I'm not going to do or not do something because of money. So if like, it's a good idea and the only reason I'm not going to do it is because of money or if it's a bad idea or, you know what I mean? I wasn't going to do money-based decisions. I was going to do decisions based on what I wanted to do. And so like I've made six figures at some of these jobs, but you know, after getting fired and then not getting a job for a while, I've, there's been times when I've been living with basically negative money, especially if you include debt. I think you're incredibly brave, Ben. That's a high praise from you. I appreciate that. And you did something very brave recently that I'd love to hear a little bit more about is you actually got up and stay on a stage. For my first time ever. Yep. Good for you. Can you walk us through that? Yeah. So I applied to be a speaker at PodFest. I did not think I was going to get accepted. I also didn't think I had a way of going there or like either financially or emotionally or whatever, but it was my first ever public speech. It was according to the person who was hosting the room. She said it was probably around 200 people or something like that. And it's funny because sometimes the main stage, if it wasn't an interesting topic, would only have like 12 people, even though that seats 300 in the room. So since we had so many speakers and there was a surprise speaker of William Hung from American Idol fame there that we even didn't know about. And then William Hung walks up and I'm like, what in the hell is happening here? And then he sits like right next to me. So I was like, okay, first of all, do you want to be on a podcast? Here's my booking link, uh, et cetera. So I released his just four days ago, um, which is an amazing episode uh, in terms of my own uh, judgment, you know, and it was, it was fun because I like telling his story because it's a simultaneous failure and success at the exact same time. Cause he didn't succeed at going to Hollywood. He didn't succeed at the thing. He had to miss school to do it. But then he became, it became like the biggest thing he's known for. And like, if he didn't put himself out in that way and he, he's not the stereotypical type to go do that, you know, you wouldn't expect someone who, who doesn't have the talent to sing or and whatnot to, to leave his um, civil engineering school for a couple of days just to go try out on American Idol to basically get, be taught, told talk very poorly towards by Simon and uh, and Randy. And I'm pretty sure Paula was, Paula was driving with it. Even in the, if you watch back at the American Idol thing, he just says, I did my best and I have no regrets. And it's not even like he fed into their criticism or anything. He just has a 
great positive attitude towards almost everything. And it was just really interesting to see his, his takes on some of that stuff. So how did you feel when you stepped off the stage? Unbelievable. It was amazing because I'm no offense to, I'm not going to say who, but some of the folks who did the speeches did not do a great job or did not engage with the audience as much. And according to a few people I talked to, they'd said that mine and William Hung's were their favorite, or at least mine created some sort of an energy shift in the room that then the following speakers um, benefited from, and including William Hung, but obviously he could have carried that all himself. But I was just happy because A, I didn't script anything. I just had a rough idea of what I was going to say. And B, I want to be a stand-up comedian at some point, and I got a decent amount of laughs. So that's really what I was trying to focus on and also making sure I didn't talk too fast, but I have 15 seconds to slide and it went by like instantaneously. It was like, mm -hmm. it was over before I started. Wait, I want to talk about the energy shift. Cause that's what this is. It's like one of the things you did without realizing it, you know, a few years ago was you changed your energy around failure. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we change our energy, we change our lives and the, and the script and um, it's like, change your story, change your life. You know what? Like, that's incredible. And now I love knowing that you want to be a stand-up comedian, which I had no idea. Or now a keynote speaker. I didn't know until giving the speech that I could even do that. So there you go. Because comedians have to bomb. You can't really get around that. Keynote speakers hopefully aren't bombing that much, but you never know. No, but you know what, Ben? This goes back to the same idea that... Um, because I spent many years working in stand-up comedy, not as a comedian, but in um, television, producing a lot of comedy shows. And so it takes years to hone your, your comedy chops. And so to your point, you must, failure takes you to success. That is an inherent part of the comedic journey. And I was going to say for anybody doing keynote speeches, it may not be about quote unquote bombing in the same way, but you certainly have to read a room, learn to understand uh, what the energy is and read the, the, you know, the different shifts and the nuances. And so the point is you always want to practice. You want to go do some really low, low risk or, or just go into situations where you can practice and, and make mistakes. If, if we want to say, so those aren't failures, that's actually a smart strategy, but you make mistakes and learn from them so you can move on. I actually want to go back to then what your podcast is really about. And you talk to people about their failures and what they've learned. So I'm curious about William Hung and what he had to say, you know, what has surprised you? What have, you know, what have you really learned from your podcast conversations? So I think the one thing that I learned that I thought I knew and I created it for. And so just to give a little bit of background on that is like, everybody's got their social media highlight reel and we all know it's it's bs and they're taking 100 pictures and posting their favorite one or whatever it is and i didn't like how most people who became successful would then ignore all the hard times and just talk about how great they are or whatever it is mm. even regular folks who don't have a good life are putting their good life on line lying to themselves kind of like i was lying to myself in reverse you know about how much uh, i you know, was whitewashing over or just, you know, going over the details differently than they actually happened and not learning from any of it. So uh, what amazes me is like how much failure people can endure and still mm. succeed. That's an amazing piece because there's some people who I've interviewed have had massive amounts of like obstacles in their way and still achieved success. I don't have a requirement that you're successful to be on the podcast, but people who are truly failing aren't trying to be on podcasts typically but, you know, it's not like a prerequisite that they they reach success because I don't think I've reached success either. And I think. Wait, how do you define that? Um, to be financially independent and stable so that I don't have to worry about money, essentially, would be my mm -hmm. definition. I want to be able to do what I want when I want. And so if I did all that schooling and working in corporate finance and accounting for 15 years and then I call myself the world's number one failure. And that's how I become successful. It's the funniest joke. I die laughing instantaneously just mm -hmm. on the fact that it's so stupid on the face of it, that it would work. And that's why any of this positive feedback I'm getting now is like, I'm just cracking up because it's so ridiculous that, I mean, even one year into the podcast, I was still having one download a day and it could have been me auto downloading it from, you know, being subscribed to my own podcast, but then it finally got a bump and then it got some other bumps, but I don't do a lot of marketing. I sometimes don't even let my guests know when their episode gets released. I just release it because 
it's it's just something that I control. I get to, you know, figure out how I show up. And I realized from making mistakes or like not actually with one of my guests, I hadn't, we got disconnected and I didn't hit record again until 25 minutes into our conversation. And I'm like, oh my Lord, you're not going to like this, but I'm going to have to have you say most of that again. And she didn't have time. So it became a 19 minute episode, even though we talked for a good 60 minutes. And then you learn from that. I, to me, the only way I really learn is from failure because it sticks with you so much. Even other people's failures, I don't learn as much from as my own. So when I make a mistake like that, like I'm always checking the top left of Zoom to see if it has a recording icon there. Yeah. If it's not there, I know I'm wasting both of our time. And, you know, I also kind of started it to to address probably four or five different things that are wrong with my uh, my approach to social socializing or whatever because i'm from boston and when you leave boston and go to other places they don't expect you to be having a a negative tone let's say uh so if i'm doing a podcast i have to focus on being having a better tone i have to listen more and interrupt less which are difficult things for me but if i have to edit it myself especially it's a pain for me whenever i make a mistake to have to go through and chop it up so that we're not talking over each other and stuff like that. So I try to make sure that I had to feel the pain of all my mistakes. And then basically I got to the point where I was, you know, I could go on a podcast. Sometimes I don't even know if I'm the guest or a host when I'm signing in because I'm that comfortable with, with what's going on. And that's how really ridiculous I am sometimes because I can easily get um, sidetracked by a lot of different shiny object syndrome. That's, I mean, that's kind of, why I'm wearing this. Uh, yeah, this I'm really outfit. digging the Disco Ben look today. For anyone who can't see it, and it's just like this fabulous sort of, you know, Boston Irish green. It's, you're sparkling fabulous. You know, I, but there are a lot of themes that actually show up in my podcast. And so I recently had someone named uh, Baker Machado on, who's a news anchor at Cheddar. And he talked, his word was perseverance because he's heard no over and over and over again. You know, and I've known Baker for years and I had no idea. Right. I and love so, his story with the yes, saying yes to things. Yeah, saying That's yes what I've to started things. doing. Because so if you actually listen to the whole episode, you'll really see like he was told no over and over and over again. He didn't get into school. He didn't get into the journalism program. He like begged and scraped and it was like still no, still no. And, you know, a billion, bajillion auditions and hearing no. So that's a you know a really key component to this and you just addressed it. it's like you stuck with the podcast it was somehow feeding your soul which is really important and, and and i understand that from doing my own podcast it's like because there's something about consistency and and learning and growth and and that's why i want to get into i love these conversations about how do we define success because success to me is part is is actually also in the doing like i am successfully podcasting because mm -hmm. i'm still showing up but i haven't reached i have set you know goals for myself and i haven't reached all of them but that doesn't define like whether it's exactly, you know, to be that binary between success and failure, because I think I mentioned it on your podcast. I love this quote that nobody ever failed in Hollywood. They just quit too soon. And here's the thing. It's like, you haven't quit. And I think it's such a beautiful story, Ben constantly. It's like you got pushed down over and over and over again. You internalize a lot of negative feelings on yourself. And yet somehow the spirit, you know, to rise and overcome was there and you, you know, like dig really deep. And then when we think about the podcast, continue to show up, show up, show up, show up, show up. And like, now we know it's, you know, you have like a, this legitimate impactful global reach. And so from where I sit, it's not necessarily your definition of success because you've set your own goals, but I'm like, Ben's a freaking successful podcaster who completely reinvented his life and completely like reframed and changed his story. I love it. Well, so one, th I've got a couple things to say. Uh, first, what you said about cheddar is one thing I found consistent with almost all my guests, which is resilience. The more mm -hmm. resilience that you have or build through facing, you know, obstacles and things like that, the more likely you're going to, if you just don't quit and you're relentless about it, you'll eventually make it somewhere in something. If you have any ability or you'll die trying, but that's like how life works. I mean, Otherwise, you have to buy into some other one's other person's blueprint and live a life that you might not be happy with. And um, I think with the podcast, I didn't care how many people were listening. Honestly, I would look at it as a metric of if I'm doing something right or wrong. But my goal was record episodes. If I can control the goal, which is record more episodes, not even release them because I wasn't consistent as I had to be with releasing them. But if I was like, if I make it a goal that I can control, I can't control how many people listen but I can't control how many I record. I can control how much I get better at it. You know, I can control certain things around goal setting. 
that are unrelated to vanity metrics or what comes in from like people. And I think there was one last part that you said that I wanted to touch on, which is whether or not I think uh, maybe I'm a successful podcaster or whatever, but I, I am a jack of all trades, master of none kind of guy. So I've learned how to oil paint with Bob Ross and got, got really good with it. Got it down from five, it took me five hours while watching his 30 minute long thing. So I'd pause it every like two seconds to do what he did. I was like, okay. And I originally was trying to just go to sleep to his podcast, to him, sorry, to his uh, show. And I was like, oh, I could do all these things. I'm going to start doing all these, <laughs> all these things. Like I could do every little thing he did. So I'm going to buy a bunch of paint and then I do that. So then also I, I learned how to play uh, guitar and I was in the band and we had a show in Boston. And like, I basically do all these things just to prove to myself I can do it. I get to a certain level of proficiency. And then I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that forever. So on to the next thing. And usually because I have a full time job, like it wasn't like I was ever going to get out of that and be able to do something other than my full time job. It was just these were random hobbies that I would pick up, do something for a while, get to a certain level of skill and then go, OK, on to the next thing. And so podcasting was going to be just another one of those things. But it's been I mean, I could talk forever. So it's not like I'm going to stop wanting to talk to interesting people about stuff. So I don't think I'll ever lose that. Um, that kind of drive. I think this could be a whole nother podcast. I want to support you through this as having, but we'll, we'll, we'll table it right there. I'm like blown away impressed that you learned to paint oil paint with Bob Ross. Like you're the first person I know. I'm just obsessed with the Show videos. You. They're amazing actually. I've watched, but have never actually taken, you know, paint to palette to the canvas. So is there a, a next skill you want to master? Yeah. Speaking in public, public speaking. You're gonna I got do my it. first taste of it because I got one. I've got one under my belt. I had done one before where I promoted the hell out of it. It was an Excel talk. One person showed up. It was at a Microsoft store in the mall. You'd think that would be a good location to try. And I was promoting it for like a month and a half with all my networking groups. One person showed up and then one of the employees sat down. So if that's counting as public speaking, that would have been my first engagement. And then <laughs> Podfest, which if you go to my MDB profile, you'll see that video is there. Everyone said I knocked it out of the park. And all these people were like asking me to whatever, take selfies with them and stuff. And I'm like, this isn't normal. This is not what happens. I don't, I'm not the energy shift guy. I'm not the one who should be, I, you know, it was more like people need to hear this message, I think, about destigmatizing failure, whatever way you talk about it. It's more like getting comfortable with not succeeding until you succeed mm -hmm. is really what it is. But um yeah i love the the paintings i was making were beautiful uh the problem is i was in like a dexter like basement because you have to have plastic wrap everywhere because <laughs> it goes everywhere the first time i did it was in my ex's bedroom and i got oil paint all over her bed and her, her, and her pillow and everything and i was like okay i need to like take this down to the basement and like cover everything in in whatever and then i got to the point where i didn't have to watch bob ross i could use my notes it took me like an hour and a half to get this tropical seascape one done and I'll send you a picture afterwards uh, if you want. It's uh, I never thought I could paint. I hope you keep playing to your strengths because that's what I keep hearing, Ben. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Thank you. Aww. And thank you for listening to Camera Ready and Able. If you're feeling stuck and looking for help to get where you know you are meant to be, please shoot me a note via my website, ableintermedia.com. And be sure to download my free ebook, 12 Tips for Success on Camera. And as always, please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already.